all of our needs, even all of our desires are found fulfilled completely in you and not in ourselves. And I ask, Lord, that you would be the comfort that we need. That you would be our peace. I pray, especially for, for Holden tonight, Lord, that you would bless him, give him um, peace, and help him to feel your presence. And for Rhonda, Lord, help her to feel your love and your comfort and even your joy. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done We'll be thanking you for eternity as we, as we think about what, what would have been and what you did. And Heavenly Father, I pray for these, these people who live in the homes around us, our neighbors, our friends, that you would, you would show yourself great to them, that they would see their need to you, that they would call out, that you would save them. Help us to be diligent as your witnesses Lord, send us out into the field. Help us to be what you've called us to be. And bless us, Lord. And as we worship, I pray that we would worship with all of our hearts and that you would get the glory and the praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Start with a hymn, number 142 in your hymn books. Let's all stand and sing, There is a Fountain. Number 142.
Blessed Redeemer. of heaven are open. Everyone, sing it out. I don't believe Richie can grab it that quick and put it in, but we'll have it here. <laughs> the windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. And joy, joy, joy in my soul since Jesus made everything right. Sing it again. The wind. 
If you will, turn with me to Nehemiah this evening. Nehemiah. What I want to look at, we are going to read Nehemiah's prayer. But as I was, as I was praying and, and looking at this, what we ought to consider, um, I also I think it's important for us to see his prayer in the context of the life that he lived as well. And um, as I was thinking, what I'm entitling this evening's message is God's work. At the end of the day, the story of Nehemiah is about the accomplishment of God's work. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month uh, month of uh, Chislev in the twelfth year that I was in Susa, the citadel. That Hananiah, um, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the providence who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. The first thing I want you to notice about Nehemiah tonight is that Nehemiah saw a need. So what's happening here is he's living his life. Just to put Nehemiah in the context of of the history of, of the Old Testament, after David became king and then Solomon his son was king, there was a division And um, Judah remained in the south and Israel in the north. And those two kingdoms survived for many years afterwards as independent kingdoms. Israel never sought the Lord. And finally, after rebelling and rebelling, God finally allowed the king of Assyria to come and conquer them. And so they were carried off into exile into Assyria. And so Israel ceased to be a nation. And the only one that was left was Judah, the southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom lasted for quite a bit longer. But as the years went by, they had good kings and bad kings, and they served the Lord, and they served the Baals. But eventually, they finally got to the point where God judged Jerusalem because they would not serve the living God. And so God allowed Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian, to come in, and he conquered Jerusalem. And we looked at that last time. We looked at Daniel's life and how Daniel was realizing that the time of judgment for Jerusalem was nearing its end. Remember, Daniel read in the book of Jeremiah that it would be 70 years, and he was looking at the time, and he was praying that that the people would be allowed to go back. There's a long history and a lot to talk about here, but at the end of the day, what happened was, is a king of the king of, one of the kings of Persia, whose name was Cyrus, read in God's word that he had been decreed to send the people back. And so he chose to send some people back from Persia, from the the scattered nations. And so uh, all the places that the Jews had been scattered, some of them were allowed to return to Jerusalem. They returned with a guy named Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel began working on the temple, but he got distracted and he didn't finish it. And so the book of Ezra describes what happens, that Ezra goes back and he encourages the people to rebuild the temple. Now, Nehemiah lived in the days of Ezra. So this is going on during that time that Nehemiah is still, not only is he still in with the king of Persia, he's in Susa, the capital, but he's fairly high up, as we'll see in in a few minutes. And so he hears, as a prisoner, but as an important prisoner, he hears the state of Jerusalem, and he recognizes that Jerusalem has a need. Now, Knoxville doesn't have walls around the city. And it's probably hard for us to imagine. Matter of fact, now that we have mortars, mortars and missiles and airplanes and all those things, walls are not what they used to be in terms of protecting a city. But it used to be that if a city had walls, it was defensible. 
It wouldn't just be overthrown because if you imagine if you don't have airplanes to bomb the middle of the city, you can't get to the middle. And so the city would be a refuge, a safe place. And so the message that um, his brothers bring to Nehemiah is that Jerusalem is exposed and that they're being attacked and that the Jewish people are not able to do what it is they're supposed to do. So the first thing that happened is Nehemiah saw a need. And the second thing that we're going to notice here is that Nehemiah sought the Lord. When he saw a need, he didn't just check it up. He didn't gripe about it or complain about it or um, try to do something in his own power. What we're going to see, verse 4, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the Lord, before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love to those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, I was cupbearer to the king. What we see here is that Nehemiah sought the Lord. Um, if you look at this prayer, this prayer is filled. As a matter of fact, it looks very similar to Daniel's prayer that we looked at last week. It has a section of his prayer where he is just mourning. He's weeping and fasting. He's just recognizing um, that things are not good. Then there is the fasting and praying and seeking God's face. It's not just enough to be sad. I think most of us here would say that we're sad about our nation but for a lot of us, and I, this is for me personally, sometimes I can just kind of put that in that that's the box I don't like category and kind of go on with life. But that's not what he did. He mourned for what was going on. And he fasted and he prayed and he sought the Lord. And he also, just like Daniel did, he looked at Scripture. When he calls, which he's going to do in just a second, when he's going to call for God's hand, he is actually looking to Scripture. So if you notice, he says, remember what rules you commanded your servant Moses. And you told him that if we didn't keep the law, you would punish us. But you also told us that if we returned to you, you would gather us back together. So he is looking to God's word for comfort. Then he is confessing guilt. We have sinned. He even goes far. Even I and my father's house have sinned. And then the asking portion, what he's actually asking for is for grace and for mercy. Lord, do something. And you can see by the way he ends this and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Well, who's the man? Well, I was cupbearer to the king. So he entirely puts things in God's court. Now, from what we can understand, if you look in verse 4, for days he is praying and weeping and mourning. And that's important for what we're about to read. So he saw a need, he sought the Lord, and then thirdly, Nehemiah waited for the Lord. Now, we're not told how long. We're not told how many days or what it was, but something happened. And we read this prayer that he prayed in, in verses uh, 4 or 5 through 11. And at some point, he was led to allow himself to look differently before the king. And he prayed specifically about that. But 
it seems as if he is waiting for God to move. Now, I think you can see this even clearly. Chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should I not be why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. What we see here is Nehemiah waiting for the Lord. He didn't just go walking into the king and said, Okay, king, here's what God told me. Instead, he continued to do his job. He's cupbearer to the king. Now, a cupbearer, when I hear just the word, what I think the word says, it's kind of obvious. He bears the cup, right? He brings the cup to the king. Well, he actually had a more important job than just handing him. He wasn't just the butler. The, the cupbearer oftentimes would be a, a guard person, someone whose job it was is to make sure that the king was okay. At minimum, he was the taste tester. Okay, so his job was to take any poison that was meant for the king. Everything that came out to the king, the king doesn't have time to watch the cook from the beginning of catching the animals all the way up through the preparation. So the safest way to make sure you can't poison the king is to put a guinea pig, a canary in the mine, if you will, someone who sits there, and that person tastes the food. The king watches them for a while and says, okay, I think it's good to eat. That's the cupbearer's job. Now, do you understand that that's an important part of this story because the king his, it's to his benefit to pay attention to how Nehemiah is feeling. Wine was before him. That means that Nehemiah had tasted the wine of the king, and now the king was having the wine. He looks at Nehemiah, and all of a sudden, Nehemiah doesn't look okay. And so the king is saying, all right, you're not sick. That's what his job was. His job was to get sick so the king didn't have to. And the king is looking at him and saying, okay, you can, I can see now that you don't look okay, but I also recognize this is not, you don't, have not been poisoned. What you have is a broken heart. So tell me about your broken heart. And I've actually heard, I've heard an entire sermon off of this, just one verse about how we pray. Nehemiah says what must have been a very short, silent prayer with his eyes open. You read that? He said, then I was afraid. But look in verse, um, verse 4. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king. So you get the understanding that these two things happened very quickly, right? The king asked him a question. He paused for a minute, and apparently in that pause, he prayed to the God of heaven, and then he said. And so the sermon that I heard was a, a comfort to us that our prayers do not have to be long and flowing, that there are times for a prayer to be nearly instant. And that's what happened in this case. I have been praying for weeks ahead of time, and all of a sudden, and this is the point I want you to see, not only did he see a need and seek the Lord, but when the time came, he waited for the Lord, and then when the time came, he took it. He recognized God's movement. That's the fourth thing. After waiting for the Lord, the king noticed. The king said, why are you sick? And now it's his turn to say, well, how can I not feel bad Jerusalem has been destroyed, and that's where my family is from, and I'm heartbroken. And so the king then says, what are you asking me to do? And he recognized that God was moving. And so Nehemiah um, responded. Verse 5, And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. 
And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to the governors of the providence beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me lumber to make beams for the gates and for the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for, for the good hand of my God was upon me. That's pretty impressive. He's recognizing that God was moving. And can you tell... (laughs) You know, can you imagine this? Well, sir, uh, since you asked, he pulls out the list. I'm going to need 12 two by four. You know, like it's, he's got a list. I need lumber. I need for the. He has thought through and worked through. And when it was time, when God moved, he responded. I think this is really important. And I, I'll tell you, church, as, as someone who is praying for our church and looking at it, I don't know if you have y'all noticed. The visitors that we've had on Sunday morning and the things, and, and there's other things that you probably don't know, at least not all of you know all of it, and I don't know all of it, but it seems like just everywhere I turn, there's little movements. What's God doing here? What's God doing here? What's God doing here? The reason I want to come to you and I want to say we need to be on our knees is because it looks to me like God is moving. And by no means is it because of our goodness or greatness or anything else. God's God and he does what he wants when he wants. But we would be wise to be watching. And when it's time, let's go. Let's move the way he calls us to move. Now, what happens next? Well, just very quickly... I don't even know that it's, it's terribly important. There, there's been a lot of kind of debate back and forth. If you notice there, and it says the queen was sitting with him. Um, this man, Artaxerxes, most people think is the son of Xerxes, who has another name, Ahasuerus, or however you say it. And his wife, if you remember, her name was Esther. And so it's possible, we don't know, but it's possible that this queen is the queen mother and might have even been Esther herself. Now, there's a lot of people who don't really think that Esther's son became the king of Persia. He definitely doesn't seem to be a godly person overall. Just historically, where he was, it doesn't seem to be a servant. He was not a Jew. (laughs) But I do think it's interesting that these are all related things that Cyrus was in the time of Ezra and then um, and um, Zerubbabel. And then um, it is very possible, very likely, that, um, that, that Ezra would have been coming back during the time of Xerxes and Esther. That, that could have been very much related. You have the queen of the land is also a Jewish person. And then now we have... Artaxerxes, we also, I don't know if you caught that, but if you're a careful student, you might have noticed that the city here is the city of Susa. That is where Esther lived. That's her, that was her home city as well. So they definitely lived in the same city. And again, people argue about times, and I'm not going to go down too deep. I'm not, I, I don't feel like I know enough to have a, 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 a very opinionated voice. But this I know, God puts people in the right places at the right times to do his will. If this queen happened to be Esther, well, you imagine what her response was. If it wasn't Esther, it doesn't matter. God still moved at that moment to make what happened happen. And Artaxerxes, not only does he allow Nehemiah to leave, but he actually allows Nehemiah's time to be paid for by the king. The house that I'm going to live in, and, and you can see that what's going on. Matter of fact, I, I didn't write this down, and I'm not sure I can find it very quickly, but toward the end, it talks about how long he was the governor. And I believe it was 12 years. So when it says, how long are you going to be gone? It wasn't, well, it's going to take me two months to get there, and I'll probably get done in two months, and I'll see you in six months. It was, I'll be gone for years. 
this is going to be a substantial portion of my adult life will be in Jerusalem fixing it. And Artaxerxes said okay. God, he, Nehemiah recognized God's movement. Then if you look down in verse 11, he gets to Jerusalem. So chapter 2, verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. And I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went to the fountain gate and then to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble that we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem so that we, we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. What we see here is that Nehemiah planned. I heard a story one time. There's, you probably have met people like this. Someone who really didn't believe in buying gas felt like that when God would provide, he would provide. And so he ended up walking a lot. <laughs> and at the end of the day, and you've probably heard this story of the, of the man that was on top of his house during a, a flood. And God sent him a boat. The boat came up and he said, no, 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 God's going to rescue me. You can go on. A little bit later, God sent him another boat. No, 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 I'm okay. God's going to rescue me. And then God sent him a helicopter. No, 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 I'm good, good. And finally, the water rose up and he drowned. And when he stood before the Lord... He said, Lord, why did, I, why did you not come and rescue you? He said, well, I sent you two boats and a helicopter, right? And, and we, that's kind of a funny joke, but there is a point behind that joke. And the point is, is that God does use us for his work. And he actually uses all of us. He doesn't just use our labor, he uses our minds, Yes, I mean, this story of Nehemiah rebuilding the wall is a story of God's provision and God's movement and God's hand, God's love, God's protection, all of those things. The sovereignty of God is displayed fully in the story of Nehemiah. And at the same time, we see a man who has dedicated his life to serving God. So what's he doing? Well, he's asking the king specifically for what wood he needs and where he needs it from. He's going around the wall. He doesn't just show up at Jerusalem and say, well, God has ordained for there to be a gate. Tomorrow begins construction. He went around. And the detailed account of how he's going around lets us know that he's inspecting. He says, okay, this one is only a foot high. It needs to be 12 foot. So we've got 11 feet. Okay, need to make some calculations. And he is planning the work. Again, as a church, we should be aware of this. Have you thought what would happen next Sunday morning if eight kids between the age of birth and three came in the back door? I was going to say walk in, but the younger ones won't be walking. Do we have a plan? What would it look like? And I, and I say that just with that group, but it, I mean, that could be any age group. This morning we, in our Sunday school class, I think we probably had eight free chairs. I think that's probably about right. What if 10 people came? Would we know what to do? Are we ready? My prayer is that when the Lord moves, he allows us to have the privilege of continuing to disciple other people. That's what church growth looks like. It's not numbers. It's depth. How well do we know God? And as we know God better, aren't we going to tell others? And as we tell others, aren't they going to tell others? And how are we going to grow? And what is it going to look like? I think it is very wise for us as a church to be planning. 
I hope that you're not thinking, well, we've got seven days of preaching. I'm hoping that is the beginning of a work. And we've got brand new baby Christians that we're going to need someone that has their phone number that's calling them to say, hey, have you read anything today? What are you reading? What can I help you with? What are your questions? How are you growing? What's changing? What can I pray for? And walking with them. Nehemiah planned. The sixth one, and I I really don't have time to read the whole book tonight. Did you see me look at the clock? Maybe I, no, I don't. I don't have time to read the book of Nehemiah tonight. But if you look at chapter 4, I want you to notice something else. Chapter 4, verse 1. As you're turning there, what happened is the people got busy. And again, you can see his planning. They were organized into groups and leaders stepped forward and they all took a portion. And so what happened is the entire wall began to be built at once. There was a section here and a section here and a section here. And as they built it up, they kind of started moving toward each other so that they could join the entire wall together. There was a conscientious plan to get the entire city building together. And leaders and all the rest. Now, chapter 4, verse 1. Now, when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads, and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Then if you look down in verse 7, But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as protection against them day and night. Then if you'll turn over to chapter 6, verse 1. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come and let us meet together at Hakeprahim in the plains of Ono. But they intended to do me harm, and I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a, very, a great work and cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Samballot for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel, and that is why you are, rebuild, you are building the wall. According to these reports, you wish to become their king, and you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such thing as you have said, as you say has been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind, for they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. Now when I went up into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of uh, Tabel, who was confined to his home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, Should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Samballot had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin, and so they should give me a bad name in order to taunt me. 
Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, oh my God, according to these things that they did. And also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. You hear what happened? I can summarize all of this. This is the sixth point. Nehemiah recognized threats. Now these two people are enemies. They are the enemies of Nehemiah. And they kind of are like Haman in the story of Esther. Anytime you see Haman in the story of Esther, you know that it is hatred toward the Jews that he is showing. And the same way, when you see these two men, Sanballat and Tobiah, they are the enemies of the work that Nehemiah is doing. Now, I skipped a large section. What we find in that middle section is they actually did get an army. And they were ready. They were going to come and, and basically be kind of like terrorists mix in with the people and all of a sudden brandish their swords and cut down the workers of the wall and they were going to stop it by force. So notice the way they tried. Intimidation, force. They didn't actually go through with it because um, Nehemiah found out about it. And, and this is, when I was a little boy, we did a musical. And the musical was about Nehemiah and I remember, what I remember from that musical of all things is they had trowels in one hand for rebuilding the wall and swords in the other so that they could fight. If you want to read the story this week, you'll read that that's straight out of the scripture, that the men did the work with their ready to defend in one hand and yet not stopping the work and continuing to build in the other, with the other hand. So the attack didn't work. And then there was the slander. Well, you're just trying to make yourself a king. Well, you know that's not true. Well, come on, we need to make a plan. We better tell the king the truth. Why don't you come meet with us? Nope, not going to do it. It's not true. I'm going back to work. So he dodged that bullet. There was the assassination attempt. Hey, we need to meet. Can you come here? Nope, I'm busy. Got to work. And then there was the opposite. They're going to come kill you. Go hide in the temple. Well, I'm not going to do that either. You see, there's several different attacks from several different directions. The enemy of the Jewish people wanted to stop the work. Now, how, do we help, how, how can we understand that in our own lives? The enemy of the people of God wants to stop the work. And there's a thousand ways he'll do it. Uh, I really think that we as a church were sitting on this doorstep in 2020. And yet, that it was a crazy year. There was attacks in lots of different directions at lots of different times. And my prayer is that we weathered them well. <laughs> Let's keep doing the work. But let me tell you, we, this is what we were praying right before service, is that, you know, if the Lord allows there to be growth, you can be guaranteed that the attack will increase. Satan does not want churches to succeed. He does not want God's name to be proclaimed, and he doesn't want people to know God better. And so what happens is he attacks. And we as the people of God have got to learn, number one, not to ignore it, pick up your sword, but also to don't stop. There was a point in this attack that they would have won if what happened is Nehemiah turned everything into defense. Let's pick up a sword. Everyone protect the wall. That's, they did have to pick up swords, but they did not stop the work. May we not stop the work. Whatever it takes. Late nights, early mornings, fasting, Whatever it takes, may we be faithful to the Lord and may he protect us. And if you notice in all of these things, it's not as if Nehemiah was kind of this bulletproof man that showed no fear ever. Instead, what we see him constantly saying is, oh Lord, protect us. He just continued to bring it to the Lord. Number seven. Nehemiah sought purity. 
Now again, there's, uh, there's several places, and I'm not going to read everywhere that this is discussed, but I, I'll talk about, uh, about one of the stories. There's actually two major times that he, actually three, three major events that he sought purity within the congregation of the Jewish people in Jerusalem. So we're just going to look at one of them, and it's in chapter 5, verse 1. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children, yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved, and it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. There was a disunity that was happening within the people of God. These were Jewish people, and the Jewish nobility, if you will, were oppressing the Jewish peasants, if you will. That's what was happening. And so, Nehemiah, serving as governor, was listening to these requests. And he's, he's telling us there were some who said this, and there were some who said that, and there were some who said the other thing, and all of them could be summed up in the rich are attacking the poor. Verse 6, I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself. And I brought charges against the nobles and the officials, and I said to them, You are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them, and said to them, We, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, The thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, We will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they promised. Now, there are some others. There was an issue about wives, and there was an issue about the treasury. So there were some other issues. But just so you can see, Nehemiah, in addition to building the wall and doing the work, was focused on the righteousness of the people living in the city. He cared about purity. We need to do the same. We need to care how we treat one another. This is... Um, when a church grows, so grow issues. <laughs> and there's all kinds of issues. The things that you would just never imagine would make you frustrated, all of a sudden would make you frustrated. Be ready for it. And in the end, seek God. Seek purity. Like we were talking about this morning, seek to walk in the good works which God has planned for us to walk in. That's what it means. Walk with Him. And lastly, and we really we could go on for a long time, but um, lastly, if you'll look at chapter 12 with me. God is the one who does the work. Chapter 12, verse 27. And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness and with thanksgivings and with singing, with cymbals, harps, and lyres. And the sons of the singers gathered together from the districts surrounding Jerusalem and from the villages of the 
Bethathites, and also from Beth Gilgal, and from the region of Geba and Asmaveth, for the singers had built for themselves villages around Jerusalem, and the priests and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people and the gates and the wall. Then I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs to give thanks, one to the south on the wall of the dung gate, and then it lists all the people that were there. And then verse 38, the other choir was of those who gave, uh, of those who gave thanks went to the north, and I followed them with half the people on the wall above the tower of the ovens to the broad wall. And it goes on to talk about where they were standing. What they did is they now had a wall, so they took the people, the singers, and put them up on the wall, and they had a, a goal, a purpose. Look down in verse 43. And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. What we're told is that Nehemiah recognized who it was who did the work. God. And when the, Jerusalem, when the walls to Jerusalem were finished, they didn't have a great celebration to thank God. Nehemiah for his sacrifices, and they didn't have a great celebration to thank Artaxerxes the king for sending the supplies. They didn't even have a celebration to thank all the workers for the hard effort that they put into it. They had a celebration to thank God for allowing it to be done, whatever the Lord does in our lives. I'm already celebrating that this year I know Two people who have accepted Christ and become Christians. I mean, I'm celebrating. God is good. Let us rejoice and remember that, that He is the one who does the work. So, God saw, uh, Nehemiah saw a need. He sought the Lord. When he sought the Lord, he was looking to Scripture, confessing his guilt, asking for grace and mercy, asking God to move. And then he waited for the Lord. And when the Lord moved, he recognized it and he understood that that's what he was doing. He planned. And he worked. And then he recognized threats when they came and he dealt with them. He recognized impurity when it showed up and he dealt with that. And then as God gave success to what they did, he also recognized that it was God who did it, and he celebrated with him. This week, as we're going about our week, be in prayer that God would move, the hearts would be stirred. Be in prayer that some of you who have never taught are going to be called on to be like, I, if the Lord wants me to, I'm willing those of you that have taught, but it's been a long time. If the Lord wants me to, he'll have to give me the strength. And whatever it is, whatever the Lord wants for us to do, that we are ready to put our hands to the work to do what we've been called to do. And may his name be glorified and lifted up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how thankful I am that we don't have to depend on our own efforts to get the job done. I know in my own life I am frail and feeble and easily discouraged and frustrated and there's, there, I have so many problems. But Heavenly Father, we rest not in man's wisdom or man's strength, but in knowing that you are in control. Give us the strength to do what you've called us to do. Give us the wisdom to plan like we ought to plan. Give us insight and direction. And in all that we do, Lord, we ask only that your name is who is glorified. You would be lifted up. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing a hymn of invitation. Number 320. <clears throat> Old foe, are you weary and troubled? No light in the dark. 
tonight well, let's be dismissed let's uh, let's sing and Lydia if you want to just give us the chord but let's just sing that chorus one more time a cappella. we'll we'll sing this as a as a dismissal hymn her eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace.